Okay, you're recording, Erica. All right. Well, welcome everybody to the uh, Vermont Climate Council Rural Resilience and Adaptation Subcommittee meeting on April 30th. Um, welcome on this rainy uh, Friday. Um, so we do have a quorum. We have uh, four members and hopefully we'll have some more join us. We've also got a couple of additional folks that are joining us from DEC. Um, I think, wait, Jens, are you with uh, DEC or are you with Fish and Wildlife? Fish and Wildlife, great, thank you. And I know that uh, Rob is joining us. Um, he joined us last week, but he is uh, joining us from DEC. Hey, Rob, I'm so happy you guys are joining us, thank you. Um, so like Catherine said, she uh, put the agenda in the chat. I'm not gonna do a roll call because we can see everybody that's on here. Um, uh, but we, let's just, let's roll into our introductions uh, topic area. And the past couple of meetings, we've been asking folks to introduce themselves in a little bit more detail. So that we Erica, can get you skipped over the approval of agenda in minutes. I did. You did. We should do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the, does everybody see the agenda in the chat? And then the minutes are linked in there. Are there any um, additions or changes that are needed to the agenda and or the minutes? No. I'm ready. Looks like we're good. <laughs> good. Okay, so now we can do introductions. Um, so we need two members and a uh, staff support person. We actually may just reverse that depending because we actually end up having more staff support than members. Um, so who of our members have not uh, introduced themselves in a little bit more detail so we can get to know you yet? I, can't I saw Mike. Mike uh, raised his hand. Yeah, I thought <laughs> Ben was volunteering too, but I, well, we I can. Well, we take you both. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll we'll go to we'll go to Ben after after Mike. Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. My name is Mike Burke. I am a field ops chief for Green Mountain Power. Uh, I've been doing. I've been in this position for twelve years for GMP. Uh, all the way back through events like Irene. So whenever I hear people talk about Irene, it brings back quite a few memories for me. Uh, I live in South Burlington with my wife and daughter uh, and love it there. The job itself, I've learned a lot about the geographics of Vermont, uh, where we get downsloping winds, where we get mid elevation, uh, heavy wet snow instead of rain, where we get ice, uh, everything like that. So I think I was approached for this because of uh, the fact that I've been doing this so long and I've, uh, I've really gotten to know the geographics of the state of Vermont and how climate affects that. So uh, I jumped at the chance to join this group. I'm excited about it. And uh, here we are. Thanks for having me. Also, Mike and I get to talk in the middle of the night quite often because <laughs> And there's a huge storm and we need crews from Canada. Guess who he calls? <laughs> so, and thank you for answering, by the way. Every time. If, if I'm, yeah, if, it, if, I, if I don't sleep through it and have to call you right back. <laughs> okay, so um, why don't we go to Ben next and then we have room for one more intro. Well, hello, everybody. I think I know most of the people, but not everybody. Um, my name is Ben Rose. I uh, report to Erica as one of her four or five now section chiefs uh, at Vermont Emergency Management. I'm the recovery and mitigation section chief. So uh, that means that um, I'm responsible for our um, interaction with FEMA on the public assistance program and the hazard mitigation program. Um, I started with the state uh, a little bit after Irene. I was asked to help by Sue Minter with the Irene Recovery Office and got dropped into FEMA world um, and uh, have filed over 30 appeals with FEMA and we've won more than half of them. 
Um, and so I guess um, my team are the FEMA whisperers, um, but um, was there when we worked on the state hazard mitigation plan, the number one priority uh, action outcome of which is to develop a state hazard mitigation program, uh, which would uh, fill in the gaps in the FEMA program and allow us to develop competitive projects for the FEMA program. So uh, we see a lot of potential in the work of the Climate um, Council, coupled with the uh, once in a lifetime availability of the ARPA resources to do a lot of good and something that could really be a game changer um, in terms of the flood vulnerability of the Vermont landscape and infrastructure. So there's that. Um, in terms of background, um, I've had different phases of my career. Um, the first third or so I was involved in recycling and composting and hazardous waste, things like that. Um, then the middle third I was involved, um, I was executive director of the Green Mountain Club. So um, had a lot of background with trails. I was a chair of the Vermont Trails and Greenways Council. Uh, back in the day was a co-founder of the Catamount Trail. Um, and then took it a little interlude in there. And I was a state representative for two terms and was clerk of the, of the House Natural Resources Committee uh, back in the late 90s. So um, I guess my claim to fame is that I believe I introduced Vermont's first climate bill. <laughs> it didn't go anywhere, but uh, it was a short form bill introduced to um, do something about the climate um, 20 years ago. <laughs> um, and, um, and yeah, and then I got dropped into FEMA world, like I said, and here I am, um, hoping to support this uh, very exciting moment in time. Ben is, um, ben is a huge asset at VEM, and it's, and it's primarily because of his like unending commitment mm -hmm. to Vermonters. Like when you talk, when, sometimes when you say that, that's a very like, cliche thing to say <laughs> but it's like I don't know anybody anybody that is more committed to like the betterment of Vermont than Ben and it you know he's you. he's amazing so and he I go to him and he comes to me hopefully with with challenges with him all the time that's our number one thing that we love to commiserate on <laughs> And I had my second vaccine dose yesterday. So if I sprout a second head or something. <laughs> you know it's working. Yeah, wow. And fun fact, when I was yet a wee lad at UVM, Ben was my professor for a solid waste management class. <laughs> nice. Also, I'm old. <laughs> now, I don't think that you're that much older than me at all. You must have been <laughs> like very early in career. Pretty old. <laughs> Erica, I, I could go if you want me to. I don't yes, believe I, I don't believe I've I've done a more formal introduction, but uh, and I would start. I would just say Ben and Mike, you guys both look really good for having your second shot yesterday. I don't, I don't see any sweat. You don't look totally yellow. <laughs> no side effects at all for me. I'm lucky. Wow, no, that, that was not the case for me, but um. Yeah, so I'm Chad Farrell. I'm the founder and CEO of Encore Renewable Energy. We are a larger scale uh, renewable energy um, developer, financier, and, and construction firm uh, based in Burlington and, and with a, a decent amount of uh, activity here in Vermont, but increasingly uh, more and more active in other states uh, within the Northeast for the most part. Um, uh, I've, um, my, my, my educational background is actually environmental engineering. Um, so I ha and so I, I have expertise in, um, in, uh, hazardous waste site, uh, remediation and cleanup, or at least I used to, but we've sort of leveraged that in Encore and we try to find, um, environmentally challenged sites for our, our solar projects. Cause let's face it, solar takes up a decent amount of room and, why not leverage these cap closed landfills, large, larger scale brownfield sites? Um, so, but I, I think I have expertise in um, basically all things distributed generation, um, the design, permitting, finance, construction, um, a little bit of land use planning knowledge, certainly nowhere near the degree of Catherine's, 
Um, but uh, definitely, definitely spent some time uh, in that world. And um, yeah, I guess I, I live in the south end of Burlington. I'm a single dad. I've got a 10 year old daughter, Maeve, a seven year old son named Walter and a pandemic puppy named Crosby, uh, red bone coon hound. So uh, yeah, um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be serving on the Climate Council. Um, I also serve on the boards of Renewable Energy Vermont and the Vermont Natural Resources Council. Thank you all three of you. That's, I just love these, these expanded intros. Sure. Appreciate that. Um, so Catherine, should we do member updates now? Excellent um, idea, Erica. <laughs> I meant to uh, revise this last week. I was talking about the fact that we would um, actually um, change this to uh, member updates as well as liaison updates. And this is where, you know, folks like Chad, who are um, who was our liaison to the cross sector mitigation subcommittee, would have a standing time to update this subcommittee. Um, I just didn't make that very clear in the agenda, but that's really where we want that to be, um, as well as any other um, general updates that um, members have. So what, why don't we start off with Chad to see if he has anything to update and then we can open it up to the rest of the group. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Erica. Um, so yeah, I did attend my first cross-sector mitigation subcommittee meeting yesterday. Um, they meet uh, every other Thursday for a full three hours, um, it's decent, decent push. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's starting to get, it's, it's starting to get interesting there. Um, uh, Liz Miller and Ed uh, McNamara provided some overall thoughts as to where um, that committee is, is going to be moving um, in terms of, you know, I think they broke it down into four different buckets um, with respect to uh, recommended policies. Um, the first was looking at the renewable energy standard. Um, the second was looking at in-state development and the efficiency thereof. So I think getting to the meaty issue of energy siting uh, in Vermont. And um, uh, there's also a decent amount of discussion around how we're gonna grow our electrical load through our thermal and building you know, trans transitions um, to electrical um, powered sources. And then the fourth bucket was looking into um, grid resiliency, um, you know, not right now. And then obviously looking forward 10, 15 years when we've got a grid that will be dominated by these, you know, what are known as inverter based technologies, solar, wind, you know, it's another word for intermittent generation technologies that need to be paired with storage and, 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 and other controls to uh, control the charging and the discharging. Um, uh, so, you know, the one thing I think they would be interested in understanding, um, they did ask if we could share our work plan. Um, and so I don't know if that's in a good enough, is in good enough shape or we wanna share it in draft form, Erica and Catherine. Um, but I, you know, that, you that, was, that was a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, we don't need to do it today. I mean, they won't meet again for another two weeks. Um, but if we could get that on our, on our, on our list of to do's, um, yeah. that was the, the one ask that came out of the meeting for our subcommittee. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Actually, that probably makes sense to send it to all of the subcommittee chairs. Um, and maybe, um, and I know we'll have it on our website so that they can access it. It's just, and I think it's on the website in draft already. Um, I just wanna, it, I haven't had a chance to clean it up and just touch base with Catherine one more time before we final put a final draft, final on it. Okay, great. Sounds good. Uh, I think that's it. If anybody wants to dive a any deeper into, there was a lot, obviously a lot more discussion within each of those four buckets. Um, so be happy to, uh, to field any questions that folks have either now or offline. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, hey, Jen, Jen, you want to? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Um, I just wanted to follow up on two things that Chad said. Um, one, when cross sector meets, um, they have these four 
task leads, um, transportation buildings, um, electricity, um, and non-energy emissions. Those are the four main, you know, sectors of emissions. And so yesterday, um, Liz and Ed presented on electricity and Peter, uh, Commissioner Walk presented on uh, non-energy emissions. And so it, just especially for others who are interested here, like Joe or uh, others, like they alternate. And so if you're ever interested in seeing where things, the conversation is going, for instance, with transportation, obviously, the biggest sector of our emissions, that'll be in two weeks from now, they rotate their task lead sort of deep dives. Um, and so just interesting to pay attention as like as topics come up. And then I think there'll be an obvious sort of overlap with this subcommittee as you really tie into the rural components of what they're trying to do. Um, and then so I'll just say also that what Chad's last comment around uh, work planning, they're the only subcommittee that doesn't have a work plan yet, <laughs> which, um, and, you know, it's been a bit of a, a moving target around the milestones because of the public engagement components, as well as the, um, the technical analyses and when we'll know what, which really impacts cross sector. Um, and so um, th they're ready now um, at the urging of some of their subcommittee members to sort of put pen to paper and be a little bit more specific with work planning. And so Ch Chad's right that um, I suggested that not only this subcommittee was a really good model for detailed work plan, there are some science and data also did a really great job with a work plan. And so we're going to share that. And just if you have any comments, let me know. I agreed to work with Johanna Miller and um, um, Richard Cowart, who's the council member and co-chair on um, sort of helping them frame a work plan for them to bring forward to the subcommittee at their next meeting. So I'm glad that yours can be an example for them. So thanks. Hey. Yeah, th thank thanks. you, Jane, for clarifying the, the additional, you know, the ag discussion, uh, which was interesting and led by Peter Walk, who had just had his second shot the day before. <laughs> so he was he was not looking so good. <laughs> well, I got my shot on Tuesday, but I got the J&J, so I'm one and done. And I'm just, you know, you know. monitoring for stroke symptoms. <laughs> yeah. So. I, yeah. That's Everybody get your shot. <laughs> Everybody get your vaccine. Um, thank you. Are there any other general updates? For, oh, I see Mike's got his hand up. Yeah, the, I, thinking back to Chad, what you said, it, it just makes me think where there's going to be a lot of overlap between subcommittees. Uh, when you mentioned uh, talking about electrical grid resiliency, you know, if you look at our work plan, that is part of ours too. So I just, I'm curious how those will overlap and it's probably okay for both to be looking at it, but just something we should understand, I guess. Yeah, you bet. Um... Yeah, we'll definitely uh, track that moving forward. Um, you know, and especially in consideration of you know this this huge infrastructure federal infrastructure bill that is you know is going to drop at some point during our work here. You know, likely June or July, we'll we'll know a lot more about what's coming and where it's being allocated to. And you know, I know there's other discussions going on outside of the Climate Council uh, with respect to that uh, with the delegation and. You know, folks at GMP and Velco, and you know, members of the renewable energy development community. So, yeah, we'll, we'll keep we'll keep you all posted. The legislature as well, I would assume. Uh, yeah, I haven't actually heard that much about beyond the uh, ARPA stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like for the next slug of you know whatever the number is going to be, uh, more infrastructure focused. Um, or purely infrastructure focused. Speaking of ARPA, um, I wonder if, um, I don't know if, uh, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't offer this up. Um, I don't know, Jane, if you are tracking the, um, the ARPA budget development, um, but we had talked about the um, different buckets of funding that the governor had proposed to the legislature that the, um, at least the, the billion dollars, the big slug of money that is discretionary um, in, in how to budget for that. Um, and one $250 million slice of that pie 
is uh, was budgeted for climate change. Now that has that has translated um, into uh, some other. It, it doesn't it doesn't look as clean as that um, in the in the budget. And so there are some initiatives that made it into the um, initial ARPA budget. And uh, there are some that did not. Um, one that I'm personally disappointed did not make it in is the um, hazard mitigation program, the state level hazard mitigation program for um, uh, buying out properties and uh, increase, increasing uh, flood corridor resilience. Um, and so that's something that uh, we'll continue to track. And we understand that there's um, about $100 million that the legislature has set aside for the Climate Council to determine uh, funding priorities for. I imagine at some point at our, one of our next council meetings, we'll be having a more in-depth discussion about that. Um, but I would just encourage folks, you know, that's that's definitely something that would increase resilience. And that since that's what we're here for, um, uh, I would just uh, advocate that you, you uh, track that as well. And um, if that's something you agree with. I was really sad about that. There was a couple in Richford that I was already looking forward to calling to telling them that we have this great new way to help them. <laughs> so we'll just yeah, have to put I off just, that call. I, I think I, I'm not really, I don't know in detail what happened, but I think there was already a version of the bill and that kind of got rolling and to it was hard to meld the two together. Um, and then, you know, it was really kind of too late when we found out that what their hazard mitigation program wasn't in there. So um, it's not, but I don't think it's the end of the road. I think we're, there's still another, Ben could probably update us on, you know, where, where, we could, where there's a pathway, I guess. Yeah, um, so the House had already passed their version of the big bill when the governor laid out his ARPA plan, which included the, the, $250 million. The Senate set aside the $100 million for the Climate Council, and they included a few specific earmarks based on the ANR testimony. They included the weatherization line item, but they felt that that was a higher priority than the hazard mitigation program. They never heard any testimony on the hazard mitigation program. Um, um, a, a senator has told me that they intend to do another ARPA allocation bill in January. So we get another bite at the apple next winter and we can go into it better prepared with stories to tell that tug on the heartstrings and demonstrate the human impact of such a program. And I think we'll be ready for that. Um, but we also have the opportunity to essentially compete for a piece of the pie within the Climate Council's priorities, I hope which is why I, I hope that this, this working group will, will rally around the opportunities presented by a state hazard mitigation program. I should also say that in the absence of that being included, we have an immediate short-term problem slash crisis, which is uh, we don't know if there's gonna be a source of the non-federal match for buyouts that are in the works right now. We have young families in Bolton and in um, I think one in Highgate where we were hoping that we would have the 25% non-federal match coming from that new program. And uh, we don't know if there'll be any funding available through VHCB. Uh, we can try to go on a case-by-case -case basis to the Vermont uh, um, Disaster Recovery Fund for their $20,000 maximum grants from what is essentially a private philanthropy. But that's a tough way to... Um, cover the gap for people who are trying to get flood vulnerable structures bought out. So this is this is urgent for us programmatically. Thanks, Ben. Okay. Before um, we shift to Jay, I just have one um, member update I wanted to put out there. One for those who don't participate in the Climate Council, meetings, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of a letter that we discussed at the last um, meeting that was sent to us by the um, Vermont Renews BIPOC Advisory Council. And I'm just going to put a link in that in the chat. So I would just encourage everyone to take some time to read that letter if you haven't seen it yet. And 
we'll have time for discussion of these issues, probably another agenda, but I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. Um, and the steering committee is has or will be discussing this. And um, the Just Transitions Committee is also working on their um, the guiding principles that they're that they're going to be proposing to the council for all of our work. So I just want to make sure everybody was aware of that. Uh, and then wanted to just let those of us, those of you who are guests here at our meeting today, to just let you know that we keep it pretty informal. So if you have something that you that you urgently want to share, you don't need to wait for the public comment at the end. <laughs> and then Jane. You're muted. Two second follow up on that. Um, we did talk about it yesterday at the steering committee meeting um, in detail, and there are a couple of immediate actionable items that I could just report on. Um, one, we're thinking we've been talking so much about um, outward engagement and how to bring more voices into this conversation with Vermonters around the table, but we're also recognizing the need um, because of our uh, BIPOC members already on subcommittees and on the council are feeling perhaps that their voices aren't even being elevated in the co these conversations that are happening at subcommittees and councils meetings right now. Um, and so not only should we be focusing on um, engagement outwardly to bring more people in, but really on inreach and engagement um, at all levels within the system that is the council and subcommittees now. And so um, we have some um, suggested approaches for trainings, and I, I, I suspect and think that the next council meeting will be heavily focused on that. Um, and then one of the other components, um, try, striving to make the process more equitable, is that there's a um, motion being brought by Senator Rahm um, on the, through the Senate um, budget um, hearings this week and next week um, to increase per diem for subcommittee members and council members to $100. Um, so um, if anybody knows subcommittee, all subcommittee members and council members get the regular state per diem, which is $50. It hasn't been increased since the 80s. Um, and so um, there is notwithstanding language in other instances like parole boards and others where people get paid more than the $50 per diem. And since we have the money in our budget um, and we don't want um, cost and, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> pay to be a barrier to getting more people um, in, involved in the process, we're, we are open as the agency to support uh, paying higher per diems. And so hopefully that will move forward next week um, and be part of the budget for starting for next fiscal year. So. Awesome. Okay, I've, 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 got, I've tried to go forward for member updates and I've, I've been too quick before now. So are we all set with member updates? Okay, um, well, with that, we will move on to introduce Jay Schaefer, um, who is on video here. Uh, Jay, would you, uh, he's reached out and offered to be the liaison from the science and data subcommittee um, and uh, so Jay, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure, Erica, it's nice to see some, some familiar faces, but also I look forward to meeting some, some new faces here. So I'm a member of the Science and Data Subcommittee. My background and training is in atmospheric sciences and I'm a faculty member at Northern Vermont University, where I, as I like to say, I teach the art and science of, of weather forecasting. And uh, if you wanna know anything about extreme weather, then that's kind of my my thing and Mike Burke and I, um, Mike, don't don't uh, don't go me ask, asking me questions about the weather today. Uh, but we work pretty closely on storm preparedness, for example, with the utilities and, and wearing other hats and whatnot. So I really wanted to be here to listen and offer some ideas of how we could collaborate to improve all of our knowledge sharing. And I did watch most of your meetings, to kind of get the feel for for where that's at and where we could prioritize some of our efforts to, to support this group, right? That really is the, the lens there. Um, Erica, do you want me to, I have some ways of framing this. Should I just keep going here? Oh yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, as I was thinking about this, we're trying to evaluate a lot of risk here and what climate could look like. And I, you know, there's a lot of people work in this science and data more on the emissions modeling and whatnot. And that's not really what I'm here to wear the hat about. It's more about what is our future climate gonna look like? 
and understanding future risks um, and climate impacts. Um, one thing I heard a lot of discussion around in this group was there's a lot of different use cases. We're talking about agriculture, we're talking about things like power outages, we're talking about flooding. Um, and each one of those can relate to something that might be more of a one-off extreme weather event, a storm like Tropical Storm Irene, or agricultural impacts might be very asynchronous, like mm -hmm. there could be a long-term drought, right? And that, that's more a seasonal shift that might classify itself more into a, a climate seasonal shift than an extreme weather event. So providing some clarity on that and organizing our thought process a little bit on that is I think a place where um, Leslie Ann and myself and our training and background could help with, um, you know, having doing some work in this space right now. And then the hazard mitigation plan, Erica, is that correct? The 2018 version is the most recent version that's, that's correct. dated? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of this analysis there, as Erica has pointed out in the past, but um, how do we build off of that and, you know, evaluate some of those risks? A lot of it focuses on flooding, and those are things that we know and we have data on. Um, a lot of these risks, things like we were talking about in our other committee on things like uh, vector-borne diseases and invasive species, it's hard to know if we don't have enough data to maybe to act on it. That's more of a long-term thing, but we probably know data about some of the shorter term seasonal impacts in agriculture. So trying to evaluate all of these things, breaking them down into different classes and breaking them into different timescales and then different levels of actionability in the master plan of how we're thinking about it. I think this is just where my head goes. Um, and I just wanna offer that there. And I, I, I think that's probably enough. I wanna see where you guys are thinking uh, along those lines. I like that approach. I, it's, it's, it's occurred to me. I mean, I know we've, we've spent a lot of time focusing on floods, which are these instantaneous events. You know, even though they're happening more frequently, they're kind of like the big marquee events and they get all the headlines. <clears throat> but there's, it's the incremental changes that I think are harder to kind of figure out how we deal with those. And, you know, and I'm in you know, transportation and it may not be as exciting to some people, but when I think about just the temperature variation and how that's affecting our pavement design. Um, you know, when you have colder, colder days and warmer days, it's just harder to design for those sort of bigger ranges. And it's, it's resulting in, you know, our, our pavements uh, deteriorating maybe faster. And the more money we have to spend on pavement, the less money we have to spend on other things that maybe can help mitigate, you know, climate change, like walking, biking, transit, that, those, those sorts of things. So I, I, you know, I've been thinking in my mind, it's like, you, you have the threat of what are, whatever's coming out of climate change, and then it's sort of how is it manifesting itself in the time scale. And I, I think that would be really helpful to sort of understand those dimensions of it, because it, it also kind of, I think, goes to, um, you know, how soon, do we, how soon do we need to react? You know, do we have time to react, or is this, is this something that's happening like right now, we have to do something right now? which I think can kind of feed into our the plan and the prioritization and all, and all of that. So that's sort our of information I think would be really helpful. Yeah, more freeze thawing episodes, you know, milder, yeah. milder winters, our climate's still cold enough that that produces a lot more stress is what you're saying, right? Yeah, and there's sort of spinoffs too, or, you know, or, or I don't know if cascading events is the right term, but you know, so now we might be using more salt on the roads and there's more runoff and that goes into the, you know, gets into the water and then there's implications to wildlife and, and I'm sure Jens can talk about all of that. And, you know, it, you know, it's just, it, so yeah, it's like thinking about all those connections a little bit more. Yeah. And I guess the one thing I didn't mention here is also about trying to think about scenario modeling and the bringing the state of the art, what does our climate look like in 30 or 50 years? How the seasonal changes are changing, but also those extreme events are changing and pulling that work in. And we might probably have to work with some external partners on that, um, what that looks like exactly. But that's something we have some, you know, between Leslie Ann and myself have some experience and training in to help understand that and, and localize it. Well, I'm happy that you're joining us, Jay. Um, mostly because I'm a weather geek myself and uh, an amateur weather geek <laughs> at that. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know an emergency manager that's not an amateur weather geek. Um, it, Jane, do we, does the steering committee have to vote 
on the the approval of the liaison at this point? Yeah, technically I'll still have to, Jay and um, there's another one too that'll go to the steering committee, but I would just assume it approved. One of the other things, and, and I don't know if this is the right moment to transition this around with Jay being here, but I think that it's really appropriate and um, maybe not today, maybe that we tee this up for a more substantive conversation next week or another time. But I think that one of the great things about having science and data come into these other committees, especially now that we're through the first RFP process and that's out there, which is really focused on the technical analysis needed around emissions reductions. It's really also thinking about what other science and data needs subcommittees have mm -hmm. um, in order to meet the work of their work plans. And you know, I know for you all, like we, there's like need to be thinking around the municipal vulnerability indices and what we have as tools already and what we don't have and what we need and whether that is a discrete task that gets contracted out or granted out. Um, and so it, I think that sort of reciprocity of like sharing knowledge back to science and data about where they can help um, analyze and look at what we know and or what we would need to contract out um, is also really important. Great. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. So, so Jane, as a liaison here, should I just assume to attend these meetings um, indefinitely? Welcome to the team. So Welcome to the team. Okay. We won't <laughs> let you go now. You're here permanently. Uh, all right. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I do as have- As is the mantra of the Climate Council, yeah. we just meet. We just We're, meet all the time. <laughs> yeah. We are, um, I'm wrapping up my semester and I have a two o'clock I'm gonna have to go to for, for class today, but we only have a few more weeks of classes, so it won't be a problem. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so um, why don't we go over to Joe Segali, um, who uh, asked to talk with the subcommittee uh, a little bit more in depth about um, the first objective in terms of the inventory. Okay, I'm gonna, if you guys don't mind, I'm gonna share my screen. That'd be helpful, thanks. Joe, I'll just say this came up at Ag and Ecosystems today too. And they anxiously are waiting for you, you to sort of coordinate with them and have them work with you on this too, so. Yeah, I've had a, I, I did exchange a, a couple of emails with um, with Billy and with Abby and, you know, and, and at the moment they, they don't really have much to share, but it's on their radar. And I think, you know, when, when they're ready, we'll figure it out. Um, so can you guys see this okay? Um, this is this this is what I uh, I guess I call it the priority one tasks. For some reason they start at B, not A, <laughs> one B, and maybe I have an older version. But um, you know the first the first few tasks uh, one B through one E are really about a big part of it is just building the inventory of adaptation and resilience activities and. You know, and I think we're in pretty good shape on that, at least working on it. And I think that's, you know, that's where we're going to be focusing right now. Um, but, you know, ultimately, we're, we're trying to get to task 1F, which, which, which is identifying, um, you know, where the gaps are and generating a list of uh, program and policy, you know, recommendations. Um, and, and so um, I think that the challenge that we're, we've met a couple times already and we're, we're, like I said, we're kind of doing the legwork on uh, just gathering information. And, and actually I could probably use some more help from Rob and, and Jens, and I need to you know, have them take another look at the inventory to make sure that we're getting um, the right programs identified on that list, as well as um, Marianne, Stephanie and Mike are kind of reaching out as well to other people. But I think, you know, as we are looking at the inventory, it's like the challenge is like, how do we do the analysis? and um, and, and, and this is, I, I'm glad Jay's here because maybe just putting, you know, putting this up now can kind of get the wheels rolling and thinking about what sort of information we may need to kind of answer some of these um, questions. Um, and so the way we've been thinking about it is just talking about what the limitations are of existing programs and that sort of qualitative, you know, logical assessments of what the program does and, you know, where they, what, what might be missing, you know, for example, um, in our resiliency planning that we're doing at the agency, that the tool that we developed is focused on the highway network. But 
costs, but we don't really have the same assessment for the rail network, which is also really important. And we haven't really thought so much about it in terms of um, the transit system as well. Um, cost effectiveness is always a really tough one because it's um, cost divided by you know, what the benefit is. So how do you quantify resilience and adaptation benefit? And I think I mentioned this the last time we talked about this um, at our last meeting, and maybe there just needs to be a common approach to this um, across all the subcommittees. Um, I think the co-benefits are pretty straightforward. Um, you know, that's really just identifying what the other benefits are. Um, but these, these next two, I think, start to get more complicated and maybe where the some additional data might be useful just on rural community impacts um, and then low income marginalized community impacts. And um, somewhere along the lines, I've seen presentations and there are, you know, you can kind of look at that and you know, spatially, I guess, um, where populations might be um, concentrated except rural is everywhere. And um, so I'm gonna like, I'm babbling on because this is what happens when we start talking about these because I'm not really sure how to do this. Um, and what what the what the methodology has to be, and at least you know where our, the schedule that we've laid out, which is I think very reasonable. It's like we're looking at trying to get this, the analysis part of it and the prioritization part of it done by uh, the middle of July, which is you know two and a half months away or so. Um, and maybe uh, Mike and Stephanie and Marion can kind of help me, but we're we're sort of. I guess just raising this as an issue and a concern right now and seeing what sort of guidance you all might have or your thoughts on how we're really gonna kind of do this. Um, and just the last slide I'll, I'll show is, and I'll stop sharing. Um, you know, this is the basic framework that the Ag and Ecosystem um, Subcommittee has developed and they, you know, so you know, the task description, it's, you know, scale, um, multi-criteria assessment, which is, I talked about that the last time, you know, I, I think that could be a useful tool that could feed into this and the just transition guiding principles, I think could be a really useful way of screening whatever strategies that we come up with. And the equ equity assessment, I think that still needs to be developed. It seems like it's kind of similar to the guiding principles, but maybe not. Um, and then impact and feasibility. And there's this model down here um, on, uh, how to do um, feasibility, looking at different things like um, environmental feasibility, te technological feasibility, economic feasibility, et cetera. So I'm not throwing a lot at you right now, but this could be, I mean, again, I think we should probably be consistent across the subcommittees on how we're gonna prioritize whatever we come up with. So just to kind of summarize really quickly, we first have to figure out how we're gonna identify the gaps and, and how to analyze those. And, and what falls out of that process then is a list of potential recommendations on programs, policies, et cetera. And then once we get that list, it's like, how do we prioritize it? Um, so I'm not sure it's fair to ask you to help us figure this out just yet, but I, I wanna you know, get everybody starting to think about this um, a little bit at this point. So any thoughts, any answers? Does anybody have any answers? <laughs> Actually, Joe, keeping that, if, I don't know if you're able to put that slide in the chat or anything, or even keeping your screen sharing, that's helpful for me to keep that up um, just as we okay. talk about this. Sure, yeah. Because what you mentioned in terms of assessing impact um, you know, it's one thing to have the inventory, um, in, in the, in the goal of our inventory is to really just, um, I think we have to even, so we have to reference from a, um, uh, we have to reference whether or not it addresses, um, or is targeted towards rural communities or um, has a, an intended purpose for um, marginalized communities. But I'm not sure that our uh, goal here is to assess the impacts of that program on those two areas. Um, 
but I mean, I open that up for discussion because I, I think if we start getting into the uh, realm of assessing the impacts of those programs um, or how effective they are, we are gonna bury ourselves in this inventory. Um, whereas if we approach it from a more objective standpoint to say, does, is the program targeted toward rural communities? Just from a, does it check the box? Does the program have a targeted prioritization for, um, you know, uh, uh, um, marginalized communities? Does it check that box? We, we could be objective um, and just so that we have an inventory. And then when we get into the next phase of assessing where the gaps are, that's when we can really think you know, apply kind of an assessment tool um, about effectiveness. Does that make sense? It does. And Joe, that we did talk about using that methodology, right, when we were meeting. So. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It's, it's, you know, does it address, does it address needs in rural areas? That can be a yes or no. I mean, I, Quite frankly, I think most of our programs were probably going to answer yes to that. You know, they don't really exclude rural areas in any way. Like hazard mitigation doesn't exclude rural areas, for example, right? Um, right. But but so like um, when we talk about and maybe what we need to do here is define like what what would be a gap, like what would, what would we can, would consider as a committee to be a gap in the system. So for example, in that case, hazard mitigation has a known inequity in it or a known gap in it the in the uh, which I've mentioned before, which is the cost benefit analysis um, piece where a rural community that doesn't have as much of a tax base um, where the um, uh, repetitive loss may not as be be as expensive as a more affluent area um, is already at a disadvantage because it's the cost benefit analysis is not going to be there. Right. on top of the disadvantage that they are going to have a hard time um, fulfilling the match requirements. So yeah. it's already skewed toward more affluent communities that can afford to implement those hazard mitigation projects. And that also suggests to me another gap, which is um, inherent in that program as an example, is that it's reactive, not proactive. So it requires a loss in order yeah. to even be eligible when we can easily identify properties where we know losses will happen and be more proactive. Um, so maybe proactive versus reactive is one screen that we might want to think about. Let's okay. throw that out there. <laughs> that's, that's helpful. I mean, the, the general, I can't back up my slides for some reason. You're all like stuck on my screen. I can't move you. Um, you can, but, you uh, can go, you, if you, if it's more helpful to, to take it down now, that's fine. I was just trying to still wrap my mind around where we what what we needed to try and yeah, hold yeah the I, think I think I'll just close it um but you know the limitations part of it is really kind of an analysis you know and it's it's not it's a it's based on observation and experience with these programs which is kind of what you guys were talking about like the BCA has limitations that's a limitation we want to know the fact that hazard mitigate hazard mitigation is a it's sort of reactive, right? Because you can fix things that didn't get damaged to as well and with hazard mitigation, but we don't really have a good proactive hazard mitigation um, program um, prior, you know, unless there was a disaster feeding that money in the first place, right? Um, so I think that's important. And and actually, I, I, what the, your sort of, um, the fact that that $250 million wasn't going to be available, you, you guys were designing that buyout program because it was it was filling a gap that has that the federal hazard mitigation. I'm not sure what that gap is. I can't remember what it is, but it seemed like it was, there was a reason why we need just state only funds for that buyout. And th those are examples of the way that I think we probably can analyze these things. It's not, it's just hard to do a totally quantitative evaluation of these things. Um, Jean's got her hand up and then Ian has sorry. Hand up. I wanted to ask sort of a broader picture question again about the inventory, because the, the way I understand what is being directed at by the statute for the inventory is like 
um, putting forward all the, you know, broadly all the program strategies and, and initiatives that we currently have on the books in government and elsewhere that help us um, meet resiliency goals, whether that's their primary purpose or whether it's a secondary, you know, a, a secondary purpose of another program. And then for me, like, so maybe I'll pause there because that's, that's my understanding of that component. And then each subcommittee is supposed to be doing the same kind of um, inventory for program strategies and initiatives that are already on the books meeting the charges of their subcommittee. And then first and foremost, like moving forward, we would, if those programs that are already in place help us meet one of our top strategies or recommendations, then instead of creating a new program, we would look to further invest in a program that's already out there. So I, I guess for me, like all of the nitty gritty of analyzing all of the programs that you put forward in the inventory doesn't have to come till there's sort of a strategies and recommendations component of resiliency work. And we're able to identify what those programs and strategies are that we would want to elevate because of a certain strategy or recommendation. Is that how you see it, Joe, or others? Or am, am I, do you think I'm off base? I think we have to analyze the existing programs to understand if there's some gaps. Um, I, think, I, I think the, I think we're gonna, it's, it's gonna be hard to apply uh, like a scientific scientific methodology to analyzing the programs. Um, maybe it won't, but <laughs> we have scientists on here. <laughs> but, Remember, we have um, the municipal vulnerability index too that we're going to be doing. And I wonder if we can uh, apply these programs as they see, as we see they fit the vulnerabilities, right? That's what, it, listening to this, that's making me think that. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is Jens. I would just add that, you know, uh, assessing the 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 gaps with these existing programs might be a little off. Maybe we want to uh, assess what the the kind of world uh, if we were to dramatically fund all of these programs, what would the resilient landscape look like that 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 funding landscape would create. You know what would that look like, and what would be the gaps in that resulting uh, resilient landscape? So I just want to, you know, because we're comparing programs that have been dramatically underfunded for years, and so when we look for the gaps, are those problems that were just because of underfunding, or are those pro problems that could be could be handled if we were to appropriately fund those programs? Ian, Ian had his hand up. Ian, I want to make sure that you had a chance to throw your input in here. Yeah, appreciate it, Erica. And thanks. I'm taking advantage here of, of Catherine's invitation for members of the public to chime in whenever. So I, I'll try not to take too much. I like we have a huge group here. So <laughs> that, that's fair. It's, you know, it, it's appointment viewing for me, but that is part of my job. Uh, so I'm uh, the Climate and Energy Program Associate for Vermont Natural Resources Council. Um, and a lot of what I was going to say was, was just covered, frankly, but I, I just wanted to offer that from my perspective, I think one of the more useful outcomes of this particular subcommittees focus on on rural gaps in particular could be very helpful for there to be a group of people that are saying you know what are the the identifying barriers to rural uptake on existing programs or the lack of programs focused particularly on those areas and I'm hearkening back to the conversation that was had last week around you know the importance of the social infrastructure piece as much as you know the either physical infrastructure um, in terms of, you know, having strong RPCs that can help rural municipalities know when there are programs that they can access and how they can access them and that sort of thing. I just, which I realize is, is a very difficult thing to do qualitatively, but I do feel like a quantitative look at, you know, what are some of the, the unmet needs with regards to both mitigating the impacts of climate change in rural areas and allowing people to adapt in ways that improve their own resilience, economic and climatic, um, could be really important. I think, I think where we also are getting, um, so some of this is, comes right from our charge, our committee charge, where it says rural resilience and adaptation subcommittee shall identify, evaluate and analyze existing and new strategies and programs that build resilience and prepare the state's communities. Mm -hmm. That's in 
that's at that's at odds with what the um, the Global Warming Solutions Act is. I mean, the the act um, charges us to inventory the programs and um, not necessarily assess them for their effectiveness. So I think we've got to, like as a committee, maybe come to a consensus on what are we hoping to accomplish with the inventory and then the assessment of um, where the gaps are in terms of the programs that are inventoried. I think- um, that, Am I getting that right, Joe? Because I just want to be sure. I, I mean, I know you're looking for some direction and comment here. So I just want to be sure that we're, we're on the right path for you. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I went back to, to read through the act this morning just to, you know, why was, why did we structure the inventory the way we did early on? And it's hard to, I couldn't find, you know, a one-to-one, -one, you know, relationship necessarily, but it's just logical to me. And that could be the engineer in me. You kind of evaluate what's, what's going on now and look, look for where the issues are. And then that tells you kind of what you should focus on. And those turn into your recommendations. Right. And I, I think, you know, it's a pretty straightforward process, just, you know, big picture. So I, I think it's the right way to go. Um, and yeah, and I and I, I think this is related to responding to you too, but just building up what, what Yen said and also what Jane said is, you know, they're both sort of alluding to like some nirvana goal of resilience and what does that mean? Like, we don't actually have any, really what we're just trying to do is be more resilient. That's, that's all I ever hear, you know, explained as not as absolutely resilient or resilient by X. We're just trying to be more resilient and maybe that's the goal, right? And so you sort of need, and that's really what you're trying. I think Jens is kind of alluding to this too bad he had to go, but it's kind of, that's what you're trying to measure against, right? It's like, are our, our, our existing programs making us more re enough resilient or enough more resilient, however you want to say that? It, it, that is funny because I've, I have mentioned that before and, you know, in other, other talks that were, there's, when we talk about resilience, there's no like picture, there, there, there probably won't be, like if we were in a bubble <laughs> that, that was impenetrable, then without we would be resilient, but we're not, and and so the idea of resilience is not an end state. It's, it is a progressive um, uh, like movement forward uh, versus uh, a perfect end state. And I think also um, what when Jane was talking about how the strategies you'll then look to this inventory to see whether they can be met, I see it more of an iterative process that through this evaluation of the inventory, we will identify strategies um, that yeah. may include modifying these existing programs or funding them better or um, making sure we fully take advantage of any co-benefit through greenhouse gas emissions. So I see it more of an iterative process that it's not just a one feeds the other or, or vice versa. And then um, additionally, I'll just throw out some other thought, which is um, we talk a lot about adaptation, but what I'm curious about is whether our inventory or any of our work is going to address the adaptation that's going to be necessary to implement some of the recommendations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So it seems like we talk about adaptation to climate change, mm -hmm. but do we also need to consider adaptation that's necessary to implement some of the greenhouse gas emission strategies and what that looks like? Throw that out there as a bigger question. <laughs> and then finally for your screening of like where the gaps are, I think I would add kind of a category screening. Like, do we have sufficient programs to address land use? Do we have sufficient programs to address um, yeah. electrical resiliency, you know, those sorts of buckets. Okay. Ben, um, ben is go ahead, sorry. I guess I'd ask the other folks on the, our working group, do you, I'll go back and listen to the recording of the discussion we just had, because there was a lot of, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of thoughts. A yeah, lot of thoughts yeah that, was, that was thrown out there that I thought were pretty good, but I, you know, it's hard to write them all down. We're just trying yeah. to make it easier for you, Joe. Didn't that yeah. help? <laughs> we asked for help 
and you gave us some direction and some help. But I think we're, I, what I would suggest is that we're going to proceed again with cat, doing the catalog, cataloging of what's out there. And I think just doing a, jet, a first cut on the limitations to get an understanding. And then I think maybe we do a deeper dive once we kind of what comes out of that is a list of recommendations and strategies. And that's maybe where more of the analysis comes in where things like the vulnerability index or whatever else we might have. In the way that we're gonna evaluate equity, which really is still very much a work in progress, um, you know, all of that will sort of feed after we get our list of ideas. Does that sound like a reasonable way to approach this? Yeah, definitely. Ben, go ahead, Ben. Yeah, so uh, Jill, I think it does. I, I think you're on the right track and uh, it, not to be a one trick pony, but, but uh, thinking specifically about the example of the hazard mitigation program, I think that two-step process will, will work because we do have a well-established federally funded program, which includes not just disaster specific hazard mitigation funding opportunities, but the annual uh, BRIC, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities funding pot that we can compete for. And there are already some features of that federal funding stream that are um, designed to be not entirely reactive. So for example, for homes below a certain level that are in the map special flood hazard area, we don't need to have a prior flood to agree that it's cost effective to get someone out of harm's way. So, um, so we have this existing program that's part of the inventory. And in part two, you discuss what the gaps and limitations are and it, it really brings into focus why we need a state program that wraps around that and, and works with it to um, address some of the gaps in um, our ability to use it, particularly in under-resourced rural communities. So I think we'll, we'll get there very quickly through your process. Good, thanks. Did Rob have his hand up? I I did not. Oh, sorry, I apologize for that. <laughs> no, that was that was just my pointer for some reason. <laughs> oh, I know what Rob was is trying to say is that another gap will identify is that a FEMA limitation is is that requirement for the map special flood hazard area. Whereas we in Vermont, listening to our river scientists, know that it's not the map special flood hazard area we care about. It's the meander belt, and. The other thing is yeah. that we'll inventory the gap in terms of going forward. Um, we can re we can increase resilience through buyouts, but we can't keep up if people keep building things in stupid flood prone places. So the gap is to be proactive about where new housing stock is going to be built. Well, I guess I will raise my hand now. Thanks, Ben, for teeing that up. But I mean, I agree with a lot of the comments to talk about, you know, thinking about barriers, right? Um, and so we have the existing inventory and we know what kind of the barriers are with a lot of those programs to expanding those. I feel like that might be the easier charge, but what's missing entirely from the inventory? That's what I have a harder time wrapping my head around. What are we missing? What other voices do we need to hear from in terms of new programs entirely? Yeah. This is just, this is a, this is a big, big enchilada we're trying to deal with here. And, and the funding piece is one thing. I mean, it always comes down to, we can do a lot more if we have more funding, but I also think we need to take a look at, you know, where are we lacking authorities, you know, to your point, Ben, about building in dangerous places. In a, lot of, in a lot of instances, we don't have statutory authority to, to move the needle on that. And so I think we might need to look at kind of the, uh, the statutory authority gaps with respect to different programs that we identify, not just the funding gaps, so. And it seems like following on that, that this is where we're gonna need some assistance with some outreach and engagement of different stakeholders to, use the inventory as a, as a platform to ask those questions and to seek input to help us identify the gaps and strategies. Yep. Okay, Joe, is there? I, That's I, good, I, thanks, that was, that was helpful. Okay. Good. Erica, I, I wonder if this is a good time to talk about the uh, 
subject of what is a resiliency program. And so I started the uh, research into the private side of programs that are going on in Vermont, uh, you know, whether it's electric utilities, renewable energy developers and storage developers, uh, communication. And I started with communication to try to get that list together, all the government programs. And I was asked the question, a lot of the government programs on communications are to get the initial broadband service to people which I personally look at as resiliency because I feel like a home isn't as economically resilient uh, without broadband, without connectivity. Uh, but it was raised that, you know, they don't see that as a uh, resiliency type project. They're just trying to get broadband at every house. And I didn't know if anyone here, I think I'm still going to put those in the project and program list. Uh, and, but it made me go back and look at our work plan. And we actually don't call out communications anywhere in the work plan. We say community infrastructure. Wow, yeah. Uh, but I just, I stumbled on that today and I just thought I'd, I'd ask if I still feel like it should be in there, uh, but it's, it's really, the programs are built to get people mm -hmm. broadband. It's yeah. not about making broadband more resilient. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, and Joseph, or Mike, since we um, had our discussion, um, I just took another look at our charge. So communications is called out specifically in our charge. It just didn't translate um, appropriately into the work plan. Um, so it is, uh, the subcommittee will focus on pressures climate change will place on Vermont's transportation, electricity, housing, emergency services, and communications infrastructure. Um, with particular attention to uh, with challenges faced by rural communities. Yeah. Yes, and I would certainly say having no broadband in a rural community would hit that. So, okay, I'll continue with uh, I mean, with it's, that. it's, it is, but it's, I, I, I raise the concern and I, and I completely agree on this topic, right? So, you know, we need to have broadband in our communities because that does support a resilient community. Um, we can we could carry this out to the nth degree uh, and so i think it's we gotta probably not now but we need we need, probably need to have a more cohesive definition of what resilience is in vermont that we come to consensus on um because otherwise it's, we're going to be always chasing this very and you know innocuous definition that unless we define it um for vermont um and have kind of a working definition that we all agree on, we, we will be spinning our wheels. Yeah, for sure. Um, just a comment here, Mike, to say thanks for bringing that up. I think, uh, you know, broadband is critical. Like it's one of the most critical aspects of making this energy transition. Um, all of these gadgets are gonna be, you know, controlled by remote devices. Like we don't have broadband, it's gonna be really hard to, to get to um, our decarbonization goals, especially in rural parts of the state. So uh, if it was omitted, like, let's get it, let's definitely, let's move it into the work plan. Uh, it seems just absolutely critical. Yep. And are we supposed to define critical infrastructure somewhere along the line here? And I, I think we can just reinforce that it's part of, it's, it is a critical infrastructure. It is critical infrastructure, yep. Yeah, absolutely. It isn't, that's another one we have to be careful of. And I know Erica's team's more expert in this, but you can define critical infrastructure very broadly. <laughs> and so are we going to go with the very broad definition of critical infrastructure? Or are we gonna do a subset of that? So. Yeah, well, and that's why we'll have to, that's why we've got that as a task so that we can mm -hmm. come to consensus about that too. Um, which I think we've, you know, we've done, it, it, the, there's differing opinions depending on whether you live in a municipality or a town where, um, you know, your church is a piece of the critical infrastructure because it is a, you know, the, the one meeting place where everybody can get together. Well, is that statewide critical infrastructure? Mm -hmm. I don't know, so. And I, I was just gonna say this, this topic just sparked like something I've been thinking a lot about with um, and the interplay of like the short-term um, 
strategies and recommendations we need to make, like especially related to emissions requirements, but how ensuring that those short-term strategies and recommendations don't sort of um, elude us from a bigger vision for farther out. And one of the ideas, like when I think about that, is like the interconnectedness of like emissions reductions with resiliency and sequestration and like, you know, the uh, immediate need is likely electric vehicles, but a long-term strategy um, is likely, you know, a more resilient um, uh, landscape and locally based community where we just drive less, right? And that ties into resiliency. And I, I like, this is, I'll just say, if you haven't listened to Bill Gates' new book, um, it talks a lot about like the gaps of like, what short-term goals do and how they preclude us from like the long-term 2050 vision. And it was really enlightening to think about then for me, how we're going to tie it all together with resiliency, sequestration and emissions cutting. Um, and I, I think trying to think that all through with long-term vision, especially for how you define resiliency and other things will be really important for the larger climate action plan and the iterative nature of it. Um, With that comment, <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. noticing the time and that we still have a couple of agenda items left on our list, I mean, uh, one being the Climate Action Plan Framework discussion. Is that a holdover? Do we still have more to talk about there? Well, um, I, I, I want you to, uh, right before this meeting, um, I haven't had a chance since um, Monday yet, but I, and I, I think you'll all remember that when we spoke about this last Friday, we had a really robust conversation about the framing of the resiliency section of the um, outline. And I didn't make any of those changes um, for Monday's Climate Council meeting. And then on top of it, when I got to presenting it, my phone dropped me from the Zoom meeting altogether. And I think Erica picked up for me and I didn't even hear what Erica said. But um, since then, I tried to reflect um, the conversation we had last week, which was like, you know, minor structuring and changes to titles in the um, climate action plan draft outline. And I shared that with Erica and Catherine and Melissa, like two minutes before this meeting. And Melissa has now posted it also on um, your website and it's linked in your agenda. Um, and really it, it gets at, um, you know, that heading that we spent some time diving into community resilience and how that could be um, a catch-all for, you know, housing, um, health, um, broader community resilience goals, and then the need to call out infrastructure resilience separately. I'd love for you, if not today, since we're running up against time, for you just to look at that, um, and I can send it around in an email because my email actually also has some comments that I don't think are showing up well on the website around thoughts around like how you would organize your work plan for it. Um, and if you see, feel like there's major gaps still, and maybe we can just um, have that as a homework and come back to it again next week, um, just to see if, if everybody's feeling like for now we have it as good as we need. And then um, because the next step for me is to develop some templates for you all to be thinking about how your work feeds into the climate action plan. I just put the link of it um, into the chat so that you can, it's on, it is on our um, website on the Agency of Administration Climate Council website. Um, so let's- See, this let's, is the old one. I don't, I don't, I so made that's not it. Don't look wondered, at that. Because it didn't seem like, okay, well, we'll have to- Yeah, don't, I, I, I've been emailing with Melissa while you guys are talking back and forth saying, I think she linked the wrong one and so, um, I'll, I'll make sure the right one is linked and I'll also send it to you in an email in case it doesn't pick up my comments. Thank you. Perfect. And then we can, we can go over that the next meeting. Um, I think we can get tied into details of an outline, um, but I think yeah. we want to be clear. It's, it is like the only way to communicate to people what we want to see <coughs> in this thing. So you gotta, you do kind of have to be a little bit detailed in the outline. Okay, thanks, Jane. Um, so we'll add that to next week's agenda then to make sure we have some real time for that. Public comment? Any members of the public would like to comment? 
Hi, this is Dale Azaria from Conservation Law Foundation. Um, I just wanted to point out, I put this in the chat in light of your conversation about what we are aiming for in terms of resilience and what resilience means. Um, I just wanted to recommend a really excellent book by uh, a woman named Judith Rizan called The Resilience Dividend. Um, she talks about resilience being not just the ability to get through challenges, but the ability to grow in the course of challenges. And it's something that I think we um, would do well to aim for as a state. I think that's a great sentiment to think about as we look at how we are defining resilience in our work. Thank you, Dale. Any other public comment? Alrighty. Yes, we have to come to the end of our time. We do schedule an hour and a half, but um, this we had some really good in-depth discussions. So um, appreciate the appreciate your time. Um, are there any other? Should we have any other wrap-up discussions? Are there any other agenda items that should be included on our on our week next week's agenda? Okay. Kathy well, and I are going to be having some discussions with Pat Field, um, as well as the Just Transitions folks, to talk about um, uh, framing uh, and uh, conversation around the equity and um, justice for this group specifically. Um, and we've been, and I know that folks that listened in on the Climate Council meeting um, on Monday, we had quite a bit of discussion um, around that. I think it's. Um, it, you know, I hearken back to the, some of the comments of um, Anna Mejia when she was with us. And when we look at, um, uh, when we look at the, the, the impacts of uh, climate change and disasters and the fact that they do impact marginalized communities uh, in a um, more substantial way, I think it's important for us to have a more in-depth discussion about that for sure. And when we do that, I think keeping in mind Dale's, Dale's point about resilience being not just getting it through, but we should think about how we're going to address that and make things better. Happy Friday, everybody. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. That's right. Did I just age myself by saying that? <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing, Kathy. <laughs>